Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing our study of the Book of Acts, and we've had 14 or 15 or 16 episodes. I, I don't remember exactly how many, but we've had a lot of uh, uh, our discussions on it. These videos are they're uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning. But today, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time with chapter 12, uh, verse 20. And uh, um, well, let's just let's just begin um, in the KJV. It says, "And Herod was highly." displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. Uh, and, and upon a, a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not the not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem uh, when they had uh, when the, they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. <clears throat> All right, so who wants to speak first today? Well, if we're going by turns, I, I think it's mine. I think uh, Ted went first yesterday. Uh, I in my uh, I usually do an entire not not shy of it, but an entire two minutes of uh, prep time for each of these uh, episodes. And I started reading this verse at uh, twelve twenty seven, and. Uh, I went, how does this relate to what we just dealt with? Peter has escaped from uh, prison with the help of the Lord. Uh, he's uh, been received by the, the church. Uh, and now we're in this next verse, on, on verse 20, and I, I couldn't relate. I, what's, what's, how does this relate to the, the previous verses? And so I quickly... Uh, open the, the Matthew Henry commentary and uh, there is no relation it, it seems. Uh, these two guys were in uh, uh, Herod's debt and evidently uh, they were uh, in fear of their lives from Herod and uh, so uh, they made friends with one of Herod's underlings and uh, uh, the rest of it I'll, I'll leave to Ted to comment on this. I'll leave the meat of this to comment on because my primary comment is I didn't quite see how this related to where we were at other than God deals with Herod in the end in a most just manner. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Ted uh, right now. Go ahead, Ted. Well, okay, brother. I think uh, to get where we... Uh, Go into uh, verse 20. I think we just got to back up into 19 just a little bit. And uh, he had those uh, guards put to death that we read about yesterday, uh, the ones that were that were guarding Peter, but uh, who are human guards against against an angel of the Lord, right? So uh, it said he, you know, he commanded, this is Herod, talking about Herod, and I want to get into Herod a little bit, something I found out online. That I've done a little bit of reading about him online. This particular Herod, this is not Herod the Great, but this is the Herod, I think, that, uh, that you even said, Joe, came after Herod the Great. Uh, it says, he, Herod, when he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode, and that means he stayed there a while. That just didn't mean he went down there for just a day or so. It, se it seems to imply that he, that he uh, lived there for a while, or stayed there at least. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. I think this is all political uh, maneuvering and political pandering. Uh, Herod obviously 
uh, had had grown out of favor with the Jews. First, he had the favor of, of the religious Jews because you know he killed James or had James killed with the sword. So uh, all the religious uh, snakes are like, all right, you know, and, and Jews are, he's finding favor in their eyes, and there's some peace there. And then what does he do? He lets the, uh, uh, I forget what you called him, Joe, yesterday, the big wig or the, the big fish, Peter, <laughs> he lets him escape from prison, and, and Peter's, Peter's gone. I think actually Peter went down to Caesarea, <laughs> uh, you know, and there he stayed. So he's loose, and... Uh, you know, this is all political maneuvering, people uh, being pleased or displeased uh, in, in other people's eyes, political leaders like Herod, rulers uh, finding much displeasure in the eyes of the public, especially the religious Jews. And so he's, from what I saw online, it's basically he's just going to go down to Caesarea for a while and lick his wounds and let things kind of kind of just smooth over and, and let things kind of tide over for a while. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know what's all, we'd have to do some, some reading uh, about uh, those people who, having made Blastus the King's Chamberlain, their friend, uh, maybe as an intercessor, you know, oh, well, this guy kind of favors our political party in this regard, so we'll get him to talk to so-and-so and so-and-so. It's uh, politics of the day, much like we have nowadays. And uh, I do want to get into 21 and following because before, before I throw it back to Luke, I just want to say this, you know, uh, there's something here that uh, doesn't seem to square with uh, what we would call, you know, the age of grace, the dispensation of grace, God dealing with everybody right now uh, as a means of grace, Christ, you know, taking all the punishment for all of man's sins, etc., cetera, etc., cetera that God isn't doling out this kind of punishment now. So what I'd like to do is throw it back to you, Luke, before we get into that, because I think this is a whole other issue. This is on the lines, to me, of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, angel, or, you know, uh, the angel of the Lord smiting Herod here. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira losing their lives, literally dying that day, whether it was heart attacks or what have you, and and then there's another place that's going to come up later in Acts where Paul, uh, a religious Jew, is is basically smoked with blindness, uh, and, he, and, he, and he went about hoping for someone to lead him by the hand, and I think it's actually Gentiles that lead him by the hand. There's so much in here that leads into other stuff, Luke. I'm going to throw it back to you before I even go a verse further and see what you think. Back to you, brother. Well, I think the first question is... Uh, that how does this fit in the context of everything else? As Joe said, he doesn't seem to see a, a connection, and I, I think that's um, uh, that a person when they decide to take on studying the Bible, there's a lot of fundamental things they have to adopt uh, principles of Bible study uh, to help them understand it. And, and one thing that many people are aware of is that. Uh, when, when these, um, the book of Acts and all the other books were written, there were no, um, they, some of them may have had an, uh, maybe a title or an, uh, an, uh, uh, an, uh, what's it called, an introduction or, or for a, a salutation, say. But the book, they didn't have titles. They didn't have chapters. They didn't have verse numbers. And uh, so if we keep that in mind, that these, these chapters and these separation points of beginning of chapter one and then uh, end in chapter two begins at this point. Uh, this is man-made. This is this is from pub interpreters and publishers, um, and it's become established. And then there's a lot of people think that that is inspired. They they find especially those people who are really into the numerology of the Bible. They think that the uh, they can give you a lot of examples of this particular verse uh, in the number of the verse uh, is has a great meaning. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in that, uh, but the point is I'm trying to make is that maybe this should have been the beginning of another chapter instead of just, and it seems to be a point that's being made between two chapters, but it's too small to be its own chapter. 
<laughs> so that's how I'm seeing the content of, of this. Uh, regarding Herod, uh, I was the one yesterday that drew the distinction between the two Herods. Uh, the first Herod was the one that uh, Joe referenced to, that he ordered the killing of the babies in Bethlehem. Uh, but that's not the Herod here. The, his son is this, the Herod we're referring to now. His son is the one that was famous for uh, wanting to meet Jesus and Pontius Pilate sent him to, to Herod. Uh, uh, Herod mocked him and sent him back to Pontius Pilate. This is the Herod. Uh, now, regarding the, your point about the dispensations, I, I don't know how that relates to anything here, but since you brought up the dispensations, and you use the term the dispensation of the grace of God, you know, just open up a big can of worms for, for me to uh, get fired up again, but just the term, the word dispensation, it only a few occurs a few times, and yet in the Bible, and yet people want to uh, assign dispensations throughout the whole all of Bible history. Uh, and the word dispen dispense means to pass out. If I'm going to dispense your paychecks, they line up, and I'm dispensing them. It says your check for the weekend. I'm dispensing. Um, famously, there is this thing called a Pez dispenser. You know, it's, it dispenses the Pez candy. Um, a dispensation, when you add I-O-N on the end of a word, it means the act of. So dispensation is the act of dispensing. If I decide to dispense these uh, little uh, paper clips in here, you know, pass them out, I'm dis dis it's the dispensation of the uh, pass di dispensing the uh, paper clips. So the dispensation of the grace of God is not a period of time, an epoch, or something like that. Many people want to apply to this word dispensation. It's just the means that it's the act of God dispensing grace. And it's not limited to uh, between uh, uh, Paul being saved and, and uh, the, the rapture, as uh, many people would say. It's not, as I see the beginning of the church, the beginning of the church's Pentecost, and then the rapture or resurrection, I see that as a singular event, but regardless of that, there's this period of time we call the church, uh, and uh, that's not the only time in history where God is dispensing grace. The only way that Abraham got saved was because God dispensed grace to him uh, as a result of his faith. <laughs> so it's always been, there. one of the channels that I recommend on my list of recommended channels is uh, uh, the name the name of the channel is grace faith 08 that's actually the name of their the slogan of their church um, and it, it's taken from Ephesians I mean uh, Ephesians 2 8 9 for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast but the point is that there's God has his part, and that's being gracious. Man has his part, and that's having faith. God has his grace, uh, is gracious, and we have faith, and that's the two things, that's the synergism and uh, that, God, that gives us salvation. Uh, now, um, regarding this thing that we haven't really even talked about that much, uh, I, I, yeah, you did you did mention that other examples of this kind of a thing. The example that came to my mind was Nebuchadnezzar. Remember what happened to him? You know, he I, I can't recount the exact story. You know, maybe you know it better than me, but you know he he was eating grass like an animal for a while, and it was it was all as a result of his same kind of a thing and attitude about that he was accepting this elevated status. People considered him God. And, and here we have this guy, uh, Herod. Uh, he struck dead because they're procl almost proclaiming him as God. Let me re get the exact terminology of that. Um, um, verse 21, and, and upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, 
if Herod had said, no, no, don't worship me, I'm not God. This is what, this is the reaction of Peter, this is the reaction of Paul, this is the reaction of angels when they appear to men. They immediately say, no, don't worship me, I'm not God. But Herod, he didn't say a word. He, and because he didn't denounce them, uh, God spoke him down, it says, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. He wasn't eaten of worms. The worms didn't kill him. Um, I, I just think that that's the order of these things. It's not like he, because he gave, um, God smote him, he was eaten of worms and then gave up the ghost. I think he gave up the ghost before the worms ate him, I, I would say. Uh, but that's how I see all that. And before we go on, any more thoughts on anything I said? Yeah, uh, I just I want to say that you're absolutely right. Uh, you made some good points, especially uh, about Nebuchadnezzar. That fits this circumstance perfectly, the hand in glove, because it is the same situation. And uh, I, I don't know if God's uh, repaying his kindness for what he tried to do to Peter or, uh, or what. And maybe it was just the fact that uh, he was sitting up there all adorned, prideful, and, and not giving uh, uh, credit to God for his oration. I don't know. But something you said uh, made me want to further comment. And that is just through this study. When we started this study, I, used, I, I proclaimed a couple of times that I consider myself uh, uh, someone who is a dispensationalist. And I've revised that based on, on uh, the stuff that I've learned from uh, Ted and you during this study. Uh, to uh, I'm no longer a, a, a dispensationalist. I'm a revelationist. Uh, the mystery's been revealed in the New Testament. Uh, nothing's changed. It's just the mystery's been revealed. And I, I was thinking the same thing Ted was saying. You know, the way the king died and the, the act of God towards him in such a, a manner, that man, that I wrote on the sidebar, this is Old Testament stuff, all right. You know, sure enough, this sounds like something God would do in the Old Testament. And then uh, Ted had mentioned, I forgot, Ananias and Sapphira. He struck them dead for, uh, for lying. Uh, that's Old Testament stuff, too. And we were going, oh, how does this make sense? Because, you know, Christ died for the sins of the world. It's our, it's not the sins of the world. He died for the sins of the world and is how God accounts them to us in eternity. We still have consequences both from God and man down here, I guess. And, uh, and I don't think it's so much, the reason we see this kind of thing dissipating as we go through the New Testament is because we start focusing on the Gentile church well, we've never been under God's law. And if you'll stop and think about it for just a second, Israel has still been under God's judgment through 1948 and still to this year. It says they're blind. They'll be scattered throughout the earth. Uh, they'll be persecuted. They'll get great blessing. They'll also receive great cursing. Well, all that Old Testament stuff is still happening to the uh, people of the Jewish bloodline today. And, and all through the past 2,000 years, they've never gotten out from under that. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, God's acting just like he did in the Old Testament towards them. And uh, so they're still under his blessing and his cursing. That hasn't changed. And so, uh, yeah, this is not, not God has, isn't acting differently. It's just we see things differently, and the Gentiles were never under the law that God put the, the bloodline of the Jewish people under. And those are my thoughts. Uh, any more to say on this, Ted? I, I want to comment on um, yeah. Joe's thoughts, but let me go, you go ahead and go first. Yeah, I, I, uh, it, it's rare that, that we disagree uh, so strongly, or, uh, but I'm going to have to strongly uh, disagree with Joe. On what he said, um, I think uh, if we don't take into account uh, the new covenant and uh, and God's God's uh, dealings with us after the cross, 
and the completeness of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, if we take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 19, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, uh, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the message of re reconciliation. Uh, uh, Hebrews, uh, the, new, the new covenant laid out in Hebrews, which quotes from the Old Testament, that after the death of Christ, when the new, new covenant comes in, their sins and lawless acts, their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. Uh, that, uh, you know, that has to be true or it's not. Now, I, I don't know how the mechanics of all that works out. I'm going to tell you what I think in a, in a nutshell. Uh, uh, I think that during the Acts period, up until Israel was, uh, and I'm going to use the word set aside, not done away with, but set aside, uh, back burner, you might say. And that happened, uh, I don't think that happened in Acts 9 or Acts 13, like the mid-Acts people. Uh, if, if somebody wants to call me an ultra-dispensationalist for saying this, that's fine. I don't care about labels. Uh, but I don't think Israel was set aside or uh, lost a place of preeminence until the end of, uh, at the end there of Acts 28, where the religious leaders finally and fully, completely divorced themselves from even, even hearing what uh, Paul and the apostles had to say. And uh, Paul, Paul pronounced the judgment on them. You've closed your eyes. You've shut your ears. And... Uh, uh, it's going to be given to another nation and another people, uh, etc., etc. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to say this, and I haven't studied this out a whole lot. Uh, I don't think that God was holding the sins of any believers uh, at all. Uh, let's say this, put it this way: in the Book of Acts, it seems, and I'm not sure about this, but it seems that unbelievers, and I think Ananias and Sapphira were unbelievers. Herod was an unbeliever. The Jewish religious leaders were an unbeliever. The guy that Paul struck, uh, kind of struck with blindness there in Acts 25 or so, he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand, uh, Mastius or whatever this guy's name was. Uh, I think Israel maybe was still under some kingdom principles uh, during the time of Acts. Now, yeah, that was after the cross. And maybe God was still giving them signs. Herod, uh, by the way, I, did, I read online about this. Herod didn't die until five days later. That's confirmed by Josephus. So he was eaten with tapeworms or whatever it was. And it, I, can, I have the quote here if you all want to hear it from Josephus about how Herod died after this moment of being struck. But it seems to me that unbelievers, and I can't understand this, but unbelievers, especially Jewish unbelievers, guys that were under the law, that was the Jews, uh, were still under some kingdom principles until they were fully set aside. Maybe that was for signs to the nation of Israel so that uh, the people could finally make up their minds. But I don't understand, and maybe you guys can help me on this, I don't understand how God could be in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and still have God dealing with unbelieving Israelites regarding their sin in these in these isolated manners and acts. I don't claim to fully understand it other than maybe these were some kingdom principles that have because you know when Christ comes back and rules and I believe there's going to be a millennium there's going to be a, a sin being dealt with immediately. Uh, grace is going to be over. I think uh, sin is going to be dealt with real quick each time it happens because, uh, for the natural people that enter the kingdom. So I don't claim to understand all this. I just think that Israelites, unbelieving Jews, were dealt with maybe under some kingdom principles there in the book of Acts. How that fits in with the new covenant and Christ dying for all the sins of the world, I don't fully know yet. I'm going to just throw that out there. All right. Uh, I want to respond to Brother Joe's uh, comment about... Uh, not being a dispensationalist, but a, a revelationist. Uh, uh, to me, I, I've said this many times about Joe, uh, we all have our particular gifts. We have spiritual gifts, but we also were born with certain kind of gifts too. Some people are, are just have a natural talent for some things, and other people can't possibly do it. They're just not gifted in that way. And, and, and Joe is very good with language. And, and he's very good at uh, he's 
he's coined quite a few terms for me over the years that, that I think have been very helpful. Um, I've often said that I'm not a KJV onlyist, but I like to look at the King James first, and then then I'm willing to look at other other translations and commentaries if it'll be helpful. But I don't want to limit myself to KJV only. So he said, "Well, you're a KJV firstist," and to me, it's, it's such a succinct way of labeling me that it, that is perfect. I mean, I'm not against labels. Labels can be helpful. Um, and then he he also used the same kind of a uh, talent he has there when I was talking about the people who claim to be the right dividers and I, I, I'm a, I, I don't think they are. I think they're, they are the over dividers and, and uh, the way I, I, I understand the scriptures uh, fitting together is the only division point is uh, before the cross and after the cross and that's the, that's the distinction um, and so he says that the uh, Instead of rightly dividing, we should think of it in terms of right, the rightly uniting, rightly uniting, unite the Bible, make it, it, it it's, a, it's a cohesive story and we need to understand it as a whole instead of making all these divisions. And now he's come up with another term called, he's not a revelation, a dispensation, but a revelationist, which is another perfect expression for this principle, and that is that uh, God, dispensations are not a period of time where God has a certain set of rules and then he changes the rules for another for 400 years and it's different rules. That's totally fallacious. Uh, as I said, dispensation means the act of dispensing. What is being dispensed? Information, knowledge about who God is and who the Savior is and how man will be saved. And so God is revealing more and more throughout the Bible. In the beginning, if you lived uh, in the time of uh, you know uh, Cain and Abel, God, not a whole lot was revealed at that point. And then by the time you have Noah and then Moses, more had been revealed. So uh, it's been a constant revelation from God, of more and more information about Him and His plan, more details being being plugged in. So now now we have the ability in our time frame of looking back and we 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 can see things so much more clearly because with the advantage of hindsight and all the things that have been revealed throughout the scriptures we can see much more clearly than they did back in the you know in Genesis for example so I, I'm really thankful I'm, I, I, I love uh, some people really object to label but uh, a, a label sometimes is a very succinct way of defining something or someone and uh, so I, I appreciate that all right. Before we go on, any last comment, Brother Joe? Before I read through. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, number one, I'm, I'm humbled and and uh, uh, my head is turned by by uh, your uh, uh, honor there. But I, you know, it, it's a lot more profitable being a leather smith than a wordsmith. But you know, I Ted changed my mind on a lot of these issues. Uh, I've got to recant some of it. Uh, I still stand by uh, the the principle in general that you pointed out, Luke, about the uh, God not changing, and I agree with that, but Ted made some valid points that I hadn't seen. I'm a, I'm a speed shooter, not necessarily that accurate, and uh, so I can I can unload my six shooter, but uh, I, I may not hit the target, and I think one or two bullets hit the target on this, but, but Ted uh, zeroed in on some things that are absolutely correct. When Christ died for the sins of the world, those sins are no longer laid against us. Now, we will have uh, consequences in the world, but after Christ's sacrifice, we don't have the judgment of God. Uh, we may have his correction, his rod of correction, but not his judgment as guilt uh, for sin. And so uh, he, that's a very valid point. And so I recant my, uh, my, my quick draw there on that point. And also, uh, I do think, though, that, that I still hold objection to one thing. I think that the nation of Israel, <clears throat> because of the bloodline, after thinking about all you had said, uh, still holds a little bit of sway with me because it says that he will bless those that bless her and curse those that curse her. Curse her. Well, that's God's judgment on people based upon their sinful or righteous acts towards Israel. So there is still 
uh, God's hand against or for people and how they treat uh, the nation of Israel. So now whether that applies to believers or not, I don't know. I know it applies to nations. I've seen it demonstrated. Uh, I have a feeling it applies to everybody. But anyway, uh, I do recant because our sins, as far as being guilty, not corrected, but guilty uh, from God, uh, are, uh, are done away with. And so uh, that, that is certainly correct and, and a, and a big-time oversight. When Ken said, I've got a big disagreement, he was right, and uh, I, I recant that part of my, uh, my comments that I made. Uh, but again, back to Nebuchadnezzar, Luke, that was, the more I think about it, the more I like that comparison. Do you know, do you realize that Nebuchadnezzar was probably, is probably in heaven right now? Uh, he was considered, you know, horrible, you know, uh, terrible, prideful king. But at the end of his life, after he went nuts, he came out of his uh, seven years of eating straw and bowed his knee to God and believed in God. Now, this is way before Abraham. So uh, I have a feeling Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, was a believer. And so uh, as hard as it is to believe, one of those, the head of gold on that statue is in heaven, I think, based upon his belief in God and his bowing of the knee to what knowledge he had. Okay, that's the sum of my thoughts. Sorry to bow that. Okay, well, this is a uh, a textual study. We're looking at the text verse by verse, sometimes a few verses at a time, and uh, and that's the that's the process that we're using. Now, there's other ways of studying the Bible, character studies. I've done many of them. Um, just about every character all the way up to uh, through uh, Joseph, uh, the son, one of the sons of uh, Jacob. Um, I've, I've done a lot of character studies. I've also done a lot of topical studies where you pick a topic like salvation or sin or, uh, you know, eternal security or any, any particular topic. But th this is not a topical study. That's why I purposely ignored Ted's comment, because I didn't want this to turn into a topical study. Now, for your information, and then I'm going to move on, you, you need to talk privately to Ted more about this subject, because you don't really understand his position. If you understood his position, you'd find out that you are still in great disagreement over, over, over this. It's just that you don't really understand the position that he's uh, putting forth. I've talked to him at more length, and uh, I've suggested that he do a, his own teaching on it, and you know, put it, put his fourth idea, his idea on this, uh, just for everybody to consider. But uh, I don't want this study to be sidetracked by going into that subject. So let me just leave it at: you don't really understand the point that Ted has made uh, at this point. So uh, I, I just recommend you guys to talk between yourselves, so talk that further. Okay, now let me read read on. Um, Okay, I'll finish that chapter. So let's go to the next chapter, chapter 13. Now again, my point I made earlier is these chapters are not necessarily the best places to divide things. Um, uh, some theologians, uh, translators, maybe even, I don't know, publishers, you know, factored into this at all. But there was no division point saying this is the beginning of chapter 13. And there's, you know, it can be very important because there, there's a very important point in, in, that I made in refuting Paul onlyism, that um, and that the problem be, is because of, of chapter division. They, they, the chapter verse one of a particular chapter says something, and they they make a big deal out of it, but they 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 don't go back to the previous chapter and read the verses before it because that's a different chapter, so they ignore it and don't consider the fact that those those thoughts are connected. And uh, so that's that's the danger of people, you know, putting a lot of um, you know weight into. Oh, it's a, it's a new chapter. All right, uh, chapter thirteen, verse one, in the KJB. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, 
and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaean, <clears throat> which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Uh, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Um, I'll read verse 4. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Uh, I guess I'll stop there. Uh, I think I'd like to read that portion in the Amplified before we, we comment on it, just to see because it wasn't real clear to me as I read it. Um, in the Amplified, it phrases it this way. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets who spoke a new message of God to the people, and teachers, uh, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, Antipas, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, um, who is Paul, uh, for the work to which I have called them. Uh, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them in approval and dedication and sent them away on their first journey. Okay. All right, go ahead. Well, it's, uh, it's it, two things that catch my attention. And uh, one is the, the fact that uh, uh, Barnabas and Saul, uh, the, the, you know how they used to call the Beatles the Fab Four? Uh, well, these are the, the uh, uh, terrible two, or whatever you want to call them, the, the actually wonderful two. I just can't think of a T word. <laughs> but uh, wordsmithing, 101. But uh, it's their first uh, uh, fiat mission. And so God has sent them on this. And the second thing is, is that there are prophets in the New Testament church who are hearing uh, instruction for, from God. Uh, this isn't uh, the, the gift of prophecy, which is for teaching, edification, correction. Uh, this, is, uh, this is special knowledge, a new message uh, given by people who operate in a prophetic gift other than teaching edification and correction, uh, to uh, send forth uh, a, a, a team that's going to be pretty renowned as the uh, as the uh, New Testament advances. Uh, over to you, Ted or Luke. Okay, I guess I'll go ahead here. Um, I think it's interesting there that. Uh, you know, certain prophets and teachers are, are in that area. And it says that uh, as they minister to the Lord, I think we can't get past those those two words there. I mean, those that, that part of the sentence there where it says, as they minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, and I believe that means uh, someone pointed out this. Uh, last year I was at church and someone pointed out, it's not like the whole an audible voice just spoke. Uh, the guy that was teaching this believes that, the Holy Ghost said this through a prophet, and as they were fasting and ministering the word there and seeking the Lord, uh, one of the prophets, uh, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And then after that, it's interesting, Luke, uh, I don't know how it read in the Amplified, I, I was listening, but I didn't really catch it, how it says, and when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. And it's like, well, listen, if the Holy Ghost just said this, the Holy Spirit said this through a prophet, uh, they fasted and prayed some more. Uh, I don't claim to understand that, but at the same time, it's like, okay, we uh, did they just fast and pray some more out of concern? Or did they, uh, you know, why did they do this? I'd like to know you guys' thoughts, because obviously this is, when the Holy Ghost says something, it's kind of like, thus saith the Lord, um, maybe they fasted and prayed for concern for, okay, we know these are the guys we're sending. Now we're just going to fast and pray and seek the Lord for their, for their discernment, for their uh, wisdom on their journey, for their protection, 
and for their the, the fruit of their ministry on their journey. Uh, I'd like to know what you guys think uh, why they fasted and prayed more uh, before they laid hands on them and sent them out. It's good stuff there. Back to you. Well, to me, what's uh, really interesting about this is the the, the timeline of these the, the events. Uh, we have about a 14-year period now between Paul's conversion and this first missionary journey of Paul. So, uh, if the timeline starts at 30 A.D. rather than 33 A.D., it would have been. Uh, Paul was converted at 36, and then his missionary started at 50, so a 14-year period. And in the first verse of Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about this 14-year period. Uh, and so now, now we're going to start really hearing a lot about Paul. This is the point where the transition is going. Now it's going to be all about Paul. First Paul and Barnabas, and then later Paul and Silas. But all the while, Luke is there with him, I believe. Uh, being his physician and also, uh, uh, you know, the historian, um, uh, Luke write, writes this. And much of the time, if we pay careful attention to the language, a lot of time, so Luke is, when he's writing, he says, we. Because he's, he's, he's saying, the way he's writing is, he says, I, I, I'm included in this, me personally, the writer. But um, that's all, uh, all I have to say about that. I'll, I'll go further, read off further unless anybody wants to talk more about any of this. Uh, I want to I want to hit on the point Ted made that I thought was a fantastic point. They they continued to pray and fast after uh, they were praying before, praying and fasting before. Uh, and uh, does it say ministering or ministering to the Lord? I'm not sure because that's a huge difference. But uh, ministering for the Lord or to the Lord, I I don't know. I, that that would be fascinating. I can't. My eyes are not good enough to see right now. But anyway. The point I, I, I took up on was Ted's uh, big point there. Did they not trust the prophets? Did they need confirmation from God? Uh, were these recognized prophets? Were they seeking further direction? Uh, I wish, uh, you know, I guess God illuminates what he wants to illuminate, but I wish he would, would say whether they were testing the prophets to get a confirmation or if they were just seeking God for further instruction. I think that's a, a pretty uh, pretty important point. That's all I got. Well, to answer your question, uh, it's phrased in the KJV, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. Now, the thing I find interesting is when it says the Holy Ghost said, and then in the Amplified, it puts it in a quotation mark, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul or Paul, for the work which I have called them, unquote. So, now, it said that. So, uh, of course, I, I'm just curious. Uh, did everybody hear it? Was it audible? Uh, who was it audible to? Uh, I don't know. It's, it doesn't really say. So these are questions that we don't have answers for, I guess. Um, all right. Uh, I'll go on unless uh, Ted has any more to say about this. Okay. Uh, so, uh, verse 4, so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bargesus. Let me, uh, we'll pick up with Bargesus next time, but for now, let's just look at verse through verse 5. Well, uh, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I'm still stuck on verse uh, the, the previous topic. I'm sorry. Uh, they were ministering to the Lord. I, I, I'm blown away by that, uh, that, that we as a people can minister not for the Lord but to the Lord. I, 
to me, I'm speechless and awestruck. Uh, it's a point that's so big that I heard not a word afterwards because my mind was wrapped around that concept. And so uh, I'm just going to go to Ted for a comment on this following verse. Yeah, that is a, that is a good point you got there, brother. They, we, you know, we do serve the Lord. Uh, he can he considers us serving him when we're doing these things. Amen. Uh, I guess in verses four and five, guys, what I'm getting here is that they are sent on on behalf of God by the by the Holy Spirit, and they departed to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. I mean, we don't get what they did in Seleucia. I mean, imagine this: if if no, nobody but the but the dock keeper, uh, the 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 dock hand at the port where they sailed into heard the message and got saved and we get to meet him in the kingdom it's something between the lines that we don't know you know we think all that happened sometimes when you read this historical book of acts is uh, just the events recorded just like I mean that reminds me of John at the end of his gospel says there were many other things which Jesus did which are not recorded in this book but the, if they were it would fill all the books of the world you know uh, the world cannot contain them I mean uh, can we imagine in the kingdom, guys, who we're going to meet that got saved uh, between the lines because of what somebody said to somebody that, that, you know, not recorded? I mean, just we just have to use our imagination. That's all it is. It'd be, uh, be kind of uh, just selective. But uh, I think it's a cool thing. And they went to these regions. Then they sailed to Cyprus. And what went on between there, we don't know. They sailed to uh, Salamis preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. So we see right there, Paul's, uh, Paul's pattern was uh, to the Jew first, you know. I think he still believed that, uh, and, and the way Paul quotes in Romans and uh, is just, I mean, it is Old Testament passage after Old Testament passage after Old Testament passage of uh, what he's fulfilling. I don't know how the, the mid-Acts guys... Uh, those mid acts dispensationalists can say, well, the area, or the, or you know, they'll say the dispensation of prophecy is over, and now we're in the prophet dispensation of mystery. Uh, and I think, just to give them credit, Luke, sometimes even when I use the word dispensation, I just mean the administration or how God is dealing with certain people at any given time. Uh, but um, Paul believed he was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And by going to the Jew first, there in verse five, it says uh, him and him and uh, Barnabas preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Uh, they didn't seek out uh, Gentile believers here, uh, although there certainly were some in those regions. Uh, we would think by now, maybe not, uh, uh, not a majority. But they're, they're, what sticks out to me is that they went to the Jew first to the synagogues to give them uh, the message of Jesus. Back to you. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified. Um, um, first, I'm backing up in the Amplified to address Joe's point about uh, as they ministered to the Lord in the KJV, it's phrased in the Amplified, while they were serving the Lord. So, um, I hate to like, like burst your bubble of your excitement over that the way it's phrased in the in the KJV, but you, I, I think you might be um, getting overly excited about something that's not really uh, to me because when you when I read as they ministered to the Lord, it's like the Lord is oh he's oh he's wounded and he's sick and we need to minister and we need to take care of him. The Lord, poor God, you know God doesn't need us. To minister to him, uh, so I think it's a much better uh, way of looking at it. Where it says while they were serving the Lord, that's how I would understand that. And then when we go um, go back to the the new verses that we were just discussing, it says so. Then being sent out of the by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When Barnabas and Saul arrived at Salamis, they began to preach the word of God proclaiming the message of eternal salvation through faith in 
Christ in the synagogues of the Jews. Well, to me, the important thing about this is that um, we don't have any mention of the gospel being preached to Gentiles anywhere yet, uh, except for Peter's um, preaching to Cornelius and his family. Even now, there is no verse that says, they, oh, they preach and the Gentiles are getting saved. I believe they are because um, after Peter explained his time with Cornelius and what happened uh, outside of Jerusalem and then and then later in Jerusalem and the church was happy about it and then they what they do they sent Barnabas and up to Antioch and I, I think that the reason he sent Barnabas to Antioch was to tell people hey Gentiles Gentiles are getting saved too so I think when Barnabas was in Antioch uh, uh, Gentiles were getting saved. It just doesn't specify it, but it's just a logical assumption. So I think Gentiles were getting saved, but still, it's not stating it specifically anywhere. And even here, it's saying Paul went to the synagogues and preached the gospel to the, to the Jews. Um, and then, uh, uh, and they had all. Oh, also had John, it says in the KJV, uh, and it's not John the Apostle that wrote the Gospel of John and the letters of John and the book of Revelation. And this is a different John. This is John Mark. Uh, so it says in the Amplified, and they also had John Mark as their assistant. Uh, when they had traveled, Oh, okay, I don't want to go to verse six yet. Okay, I'll, I'll read. I'll read that. Uh, I'll start with verse next. Next, uh, as we continue. But uh, any more thoughts on that before we move to verse six? Well, just number one that you're a party pooper, Lou. Uh, and uh, number two uh, is uh, thank goodness Ted's here to cover my hiney when I when I get caught on something and, and I can't let it go and miss what's being said next. But, uh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. I was just thinking of the verse uh, where Christ was in his humanity in the desert and was ministered to by wild beasts and angels. And I'm thinking, well, maybe God you know, still wants us to minister to him somehow. I don't know. I, I just couldn't let it go. So thanks for covering that. It passed right by and went on to the scripture you were reading. Uh, and you guys covered it well. All right. Any more, Ted, before I go on? Uh, okay, let's... Go back to the KJV, verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose, whose name was Bar-Jesus, uh, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Hmm. Let's stop there, just verse 6 and 7. Well, that's, that's, that's very interesting uh, stuff there. Uh, so there was a, a Jewish false prophet uh, uh, in the land who was of some prominence because he was with uh, a Roman. I'm going by the name here, and the fact that it didn't say he was Jewish as it did the uh, Bar-Jesus guy. So uh, here we have a, a, an authority in the land a Roman authority who's got a little devil uh, as a muse that wants to hear uh, the gospel and is so much so that he's calling for them to present him with it. That's fascinating. Back to you. Okay, let's see. All right, well, if I'm understanding the passage right, uh, when we get to verse 8, we'll know that the false prophet is. Elimaeus, the sorcerer, that's his name. Uh, but uh, as you said, Joe, uh, pointed out good that uh, uh, I'm mixed up now. Uh, I guess Bar-Jesus is his given name, and Elimaeus is his name uh, by interpretation. But the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, uh, does anyone know if this guy is... Uh, is a Jew. He says he's a, a deputy, 
But does that mean a Roman deputy? Is this guy uh, a Gentile? He would he would have been appointed by Rome if he's a deputy, and uh, it doesn't say a deputy of the synagogue. And so it sounds like a regional uh, governorship of some sort, but lower than that. But also the name is is uh, obviously Roman, and so I, I don't and and it and it did specify that Bar Jesus was a Jew, and it and it did not specify that of uh, the guy with the Roman sounding name. So I think it's safe to say he was a Roman official. Okay, so Roman uh, the Roman name Sergius Paulus is a prudent man who wanted to hear the word of God. Uh, so um, we just don't know yet. I guess we're going to go on here find out more about these guys. But we do know for sure that uh, Bar Jesus uh, was a sorcerer and he was a Jew. So let's let Luke continue on get get more light. Light reveals more light. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I I just like to uh, everybody understand that that Bar Jesus when you put Bar in front of a, a name it means the son of. So this person is the son of Jesus, but Jesus uh, is a very common name. Actually, it's like almost like today we the name John, um, uh, John or, or or Robert. You know, very common uh, modern day names. That, but Jesus was common then. But if we and that if people like to rather than say Jesus, they want to say Yeshua, and Yeshua is another way of pronouncing Joshua. Joshua was the one that followed Moses, and uh, so Joshua is the name for uh, the name of Jesus. Joshua or Yeshua or Jesus, it all is the same name. There's different ways of saying it, but um, so the like uh, when you see the name uh, Barnabas, it means. That's not actually his name, as we discovered I, in an earlier chapter. I don't remember what his actual name was, but they called him Bar jo Bar Barnabas because Bar means son of, and uh, Nabus, I guess, it means encouragement. He's the son of encouragement. He's a very encouraging personality. So um, this is the, just a little bit more about that name, Bar Jesus. Um, you got Bar Jesus, you got Bar Nabus. Uh, you got Saul. They're still calling him Saul in the KJV at this point. Um, so uh, I guess that's all. I'll, I'll, I'll continue on uh, verse. Oh, but you know, he this guy Sergius Paulus. Uh, it, it's it, he may be very much like um, uh, Cornelius. That's the impression I'm getting. Uh, he's. I imagine he's a Gentile. Just like Cornelius, who was interested in God, wanted to know about God. I mean, you don't have to be a Jewish person uh, to be interested in God, and so he wanted to know. But hear the word of God. Uh, verse eight in the KJV says, "But Elamas, the sorcerer." So Elamas is just another. Oh, says says, "For so is his name by interpretation." Um, he withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Um, then Saul, who also was called Paul, so here is the very first time that I, I remember now in the study where Paul, Saul is referred to as Paul. And, uh, you know, God changes people's names a lot of times in the scripture. Uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Uh, Abraham's name was changed to Abram. And, and, and so there's other many examples. But, uh, uh, in this case, Saul's name was not really changed to Paul. Paul is just the Roman name for Paul. That's his name. If, 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 I don't know if it's a different pronunciation or just as a Roman citizen, his official name was Paul. Uh, so then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy, filled with the Holy Ghost, sent his eyes on him. Oh, set his eyes on him. So that's verses uh, 8 and 9. Well, first of all, I, I, you know, it's important to note that uh, because of the subjugation of Israel, we have many different languages running around here. We've got Aramaic. We've got Greek, the common language of the day. We've got uh, uh, Hebrew. And so, you know, that's going to be, uh, you know, a source of, 
who, whose point of view or what uh, point of view you're looking at, but also God is big in the names. Uh, I, I'm thinking of Revelations where it's where He promises uh, to to certain faithful uh, people that He'll write your new name on a white stone and give it to you, and only He and you will ever know that special name that He gave you. So uh, I, I I find that fascinating, and uh, and so uh, God. God loves naming people properly. And so if your parents screwed up, you can count on him correcting it eventually. <laughs> so uh, I, what I find most interesting is that the devils at work here. You know, uh, this, this uh, man of faith, uh, he's, the devil is seeking to, or whoever is seeking to turn him away from the faith. So he's either already has faith in God like Cornelius did, or he's about to come into faith. Uh, because of his good character, uh, but at any rate, he's been assigned a muse, like I said the first time, and uh, and that person uh, is there strictly uh, spiritually from the dark side. To know how else would he be there to turn this man away from God? So this man evidently is very important that uh, the dark force would would send a special envoy. To uh, corrupt his uh, his character or turn him away from the faith, so that's very fascinating. Back to you. Uh, good words, Joe. Excellent. Uh, very insightful. Uh, this uh, this sorcerer, uh, Bar Jesus, Elimaeus. Uh, what you just said there. Uh, this here's a guy, you know, uh, the other guy, uh, the deputy Sergius Paulus, was prudent, meaning meaning wise and insightful, you know. And I, I agree with Luke, who said he's probably a Gentile, desiring to hear the word. He and it says he desires to hear the word of God. He probably had been seeking God, like Luke said, like Cornelius. Uh, there were there were these kind of Gentiles. They they uh, uh, they were there, and they were seeking God through through light, through conscience, uh, through through the revelation of creation, and uh, the things God had, uh, provides for every human being. But uh, look at the, look at these words. Uh, some things jump out at me. Here's a guy that is withstanding God. He withstanding God's spokesman. Uh, this guy, uh, Elimaeus. I mean, it says he withstood them in verse 8, and also, what did he do? He was seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So, uh, have we not seen this happen uh, throughout human history and right to our very day? Uh, seeing people who are not only withstanding the people of God, withstanding uh, God's revelation, the Bible, those who, people who speak for God, uh, they, they just don't stop at that. They seek to turn other people away from the faith. This, to me, uh, just like the Pharisees, the serpents of his day, uh, is the depths of depravity. Uh, this is anything but a, uh, you know, if you got your beliefs, that's fine, blah, 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 blah. I'm a live and let live guy, blah, blah, blah. This is anything but that. This is anything but the casual uh, pagan. This is uh, what we call nowadays is these uh, these pansies, snakes, uh, whatever they call themselves, the new atheists. <laughs> Not only do they do they withstand the word of God, they seek to turn others from the faith who may be seeking the faith. And uh, uh, it's too bad we can't uh, do what Paul did here to uh, to Elimaeus <laughs> nowadays with some kind of apostolic authority to, to shut them up. But uh, we're going to see how this guy's going to. Uh, Meet his match here real soon with Paul. Back to you, Luke. Mm -mm. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, Joe's point about names being so fascinating in the Bible. Uh, the names in the Bible, they they're really just about every name is, is actually a, um, an adjective. Matter of fact. Um, um, Make, I'm sure I've done it, and we've all done it, and some people do it as a way, uh, just a common practice. They're, they're name callers, always calling someone a liar, idiot, you know, whatever you're calling them names. You're giving them a name, but the name is idiot. Well, that's the, 
you're calling him a name, you're saying his name is idiot. But the it, it, the name actually describes a, a quality about this person. And that's the way it is in, in the Bible. These names all have these meanings. I've always found it interesting how when someone's born in the Bible, they're given a name, and then their, their personality turns out in life to match the name. Like Jacob, it means schemer. How could you call him schemer, Jacob from birth? And then, and then it turns out that's exactly how you describe him, him as in his life. He schemed to, to get his brother's inherit, inheritance, and uh, I mean his birthright, and then he schemed to uh, make his father think that uh, he was him when uh, he, his father was dying. And so, um, yeah, these, it is very interesting, that, uh, but that's what a name is. A name is an adjective that describes someone. Um, Yes, I'll go on here. Um, uh, verse 9, uh, no, verse 10, and said, this is what Paul says to him, O full, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, called him a name there, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. All right, Brother Joe. Wow, 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 wow. That's uh, that's that's powerful. Uh, his muse just got turned away. It didn't take Paul but two seconds to uh, discern and dispatch uh, God's judgment. So uh, thank God for that, right? And and uh, what Ted was talking about earlier with the uh, a certain brand of atheist, I, I don't know if you guys have sidebar there, but I just put evangelists and say, well, that's what this guy was, you know, and uh, and uh, Paul uh, sent him on his way quickly. So thank God for his mercies. And and I noticed that there was mercy even to the muse because it's just for a season. So obviously he didn't stay blind. So uh, God, even in his uh, judgment, uh, was merciful. Thank you. Well, this is this this passage you read, Luke, is just so full. Uh, it's just, uh, and we know there that. Uh, and by the way, Luke, I want to tell you when you read the the verses up there earlier, when you said in verse nine, when you read it before we started talking last time, uh, then Saul, who is also called Paul, I'm pretty positive that that is the very first time that Acts transitions his name uh, from from Saul to Paul. That just as an aside. But uh, this, the reason I'm using verse 9 is because it transitioned into verse 10 where it says, Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he set his eyes on, on him, on the sorcerer, and said, O oh, full of all subtlety of the devil. And my, my, my note in my King James for subtlety says deceit. I'd be interested in knowing what, when you read the Amplified Luke, uh, full of all subtlety, full of all deceit and mischief, thou child of the devil. You think of mischievous children, <laughs> spoiled brats, or something. The way the way Paul just scolds this guy, and uh, and rightfully so. Thou enemy of all righteousness, you're not just an enemy uh, of uh, you know our message talking about Jesus. I mean, the religious Jews, a lot of them were just thinking, oh, we got to get rid of the way, you know, the, the Christians, you know. But they claim to worship God. This guy was just a, a guy in the total darkness, in total sorcery. Uh, as, uh, what did uh, Joe put up in the sidebar there? Evangelist of Satan. Yeah, <laughs> it's like double, double horn satanic salute uh, and and getting glory and joy in it. You know, um, you're an enemy of all righteousness. What a what a thing to say. What a thing for Paul to pronounce on this guy. Will you uh, not cease to pervert or corrupt the right ways of the Lord? And then. Uh, Paul says, here, here's what's going to happen. The hand of the Lord is upon thee. 
Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season, for a while. As Joe pointed out, it was even the mercy of God that it was just a temporary blindness. And that's probably would open up a whole other can of worms, but just moving on here. There fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about someone to lead him by the hand. I think it's going to be uh, the deputy. Uh, Sergius Paulus is the one that <laughs> helps him out of the room or what have you there. Uh, you know, there's just so much in this, guys. But uh, this was the apostolic authority that these guys like Peter and Paul had to see right into their hearts, uh, to see what these people are full of, mischief and, and, and guile. And the judgment of God is pronounced uh, through Paul there. Absolutely. Back to you, brother. Okay. Um, I will look at it in the Amplified since you made the request. Uh, but, but verse 9, but Saul, who, all, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit and led by him, uh, looked steadily at Elymas and said, You, Elymas, who are full of every kind of deceit and every kind of fraud, you son of the devil, enemy of everything that is right and good, will you never stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now watch, the hand of the Lord is on you, and you will be blind, so blind that you will be unable to see the sun for a time. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember if I read I don't remember reading, reading the remainder of this in the KJV, but I must have. It says, immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he groped around seeking people to lead him by the hand. Okay. Uh, the um, I had something in mind to say about this, but now I don't remember. Oh, yeah. The idea of filled with the Holy Spirit, it says here, is, uh, it says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Uh, this is an, another distinction that's important to understand. That I've, I've talked about it many, many times. Uh, but if you've never heard me explain this, this is important to get. There's, there's these different um, ways that uh, the Scripture expresses the Holy Spirit in, in us. One term is baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the a Pentecostal, a charismatic, they would think that this is uh, the baptism of the Spirit. That that's uh, that's not necessary. That's uh, when you speak in tongues and you have this uh, speaking in tongues is the display, the outward display that you're being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit really just simply means that you are immersed in the Holy Spirit. We are in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in us. We are in Christ, Christ is in us. The Holy Spirit comes into us initially. That's the initial indwelling of the Spirit. And then you have the term indwelling of the Spirit, which just means that it's a continuous living. The Spirit continues living in us. Then you have the sealing of the Spirit, which means that once it's where the Spirit enters us and it continues living in us, it's sealed. It never leaves us. Uh, and it, that, that's why we can rest assured that we're going to go to heaven and we're permanently saved is because we're sealed until the day of redemption. So, uh, and then finally you have this term here, filled with the Holy Spirit. This is an Old Testament expression, and this is a pre-Pentecost expression where Jesus breathed in his apostles and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were not baptized or, or indwelled or sealed with the Holy Spirit before Pentecost, but the Holy Spirit did fill them. And the, the, the talks about Old Testament prophets and the apostles before Pentecost, they would be filled with the Holy Spirit for a purpose. It's the Spirit of God coming in them to empower them, to do, perform signs and wonders, to do a mission, to do some kind of uh, you know, um, work. And so that's, that's the proper way of understanding this in this, uh, at this context here. He's, now, would we think then that uh, someone uh, who's wrong, wrongly understands this, I would ask them, if you think filled with the Holy Spirit um, uh, doesn't mean, as I said, then 
Are we to assume then that Paul did not have the Holy Spirit in him until this moment? Now he now he's filled with the Spirit, but he got saved before. He didn't have the Spirit in him until now he's filled with it. No, he always had the Holy Spirit in him. It's just now the Holy Spirit is like bubbling up with power, giving, empowering him to, to do this rebuke and this miracle. It's not a miracle of healing. It's a miracle of blinding. <laughs> All right, any more before we move on? I had something on that, Luke. I, I like how you distinguish the uh, different ways that uh, the, the terminology around the Holy Spirit, you know, the filling, baptizing, the sealing, uh, you know, and, and the filling here, like you said, it's just, it's it's in this particular verse, verse 9, in this uh, uh, issue here where, where he's just going to lambast this guy. He's filled with it. He's overflowing, bubbling. The, the, the word of the, the I mean, the, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit is already there in him. He's obviously saved. It's just overflowing his life, and, and uh, it's about to come out in, in judgment against this guy. And, Joe, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'd like your comment on this. I think uh, whenever there's a passage of Scripture where it's uh, very derisive and rebuking, uh, I think we always just ought to have Luke read it and, and just... It just should be recorded for the ages because <laughs> the way Luke says things, the way that he uh, enunciates this this uh, judgment uh, is so uh, is so good. I imagine uh, he he reminds me of a kid who uh, who's meeting up with a bully in school, and you know Luke's got Jesus with him, and he can say anything he wants. You fraud! You child of the devil! That's the way it's coming across to me. Yeah, it, it, it's not just an amplified version. Luke gives a dramatized version, and that's so much better than amplified. And uh, I do enjoy that. And, it, and he's right on the money. He's a he's a thespian that's at heart. I think. How dare you call me a thespian? Don't don't insult me. Oh, you said thespian, not lesbian, right? Well, I, Luke, I'm a I'm a lesbian trapped in a man's body, actually, just to be politically correct about things. <laughs> All right, let me read further. And oh, by the way, it's another example of what I talked about. Joe's special talent is he's he's not amplifying it; he's dramatizing it. He's got the right word to, for the time. Uh, All right, let me go on uh, back to the. Oh, we're uh, we're getting close to running out of time here. I guess if you want to start, but four. Let me see. Um, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Uh, um, well, let's just talk about verse 12, and then I think that'll be probably a good point to stop. Verse 12, so it, well, I'll finish with the end of verse 11. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Oh, I think I, yeah, I, I read that actually uh, last time. I remember that now. Um, uh, let's let's talk about this. Uh, I don't think anybody touched on verse 12 in, as we uh, in our discussion. So let's talk about that, and then we'll prepare to conclude. Well, I, I, I'm glad you glad you gave us that opportunity because this is fascinating stuff right here. I, I again, yeah, I mentioned yesterday, uh, God puts in enough detail where we have a clear picture of what's going on, and and uh, all of a sudden it went from a kind of a, a narration into a full fledged visualization where where this guy is, you know, you can just see him feeling around, looking for someone to take his hand. He's, he's, uh, he's dumbstruck as well as blindstruck. And so, uh, wow, that, you know, that just brings it all into focus. And I think it's neat also, the very last part of the verse, where it said, uh, you know, he believed when he saw this miracle of judgment, but he was also uh, believed the gospel. And so, uh, double whammy there, uh, and uh, well worth noting. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, I, I think the same thing here, Luke um, and Joe. The the deputy had already heard the message earlier, and uh, you know, in the midst of him hearing hearing the message that happened back up in verse uh, seven and eight, 
uh, you know, then you have this guy, uh, uh, L.A. Mass, the sorcerer, you know, contending with him, you know, interrupting, uh, doing his best to to keep to keep uh, Sergius Paulus from believing. But you know, it's amazing how God does things in spite of of the enemy's tactics. And truly, that sorcerer was an enemy, uh, trying to uh, trying to stop the word of God, trying to stop the gospel from going to this guy. So in spite of uh, the sorcerer's tactics and interruptions and uh, every way he was trying to stop the deputy from believing, uh, you know, the sorcerer uh, got the boot, so to speak, and the deputy just got confirmation. He saw what was done. It's like, wow, uh, the gospel's true, and here's an affirmation, here's a confirmation. Like you've said before here on here, Luke, uh, signs and wonders were going on. Signs that uh, this is a sign, this is a signal that what the apostles are teaching is true, that the gospel is true. We can believe it by faith, but here's some signs just to confirm it. And I think this uh, passage of scripture backs that up. And he believed and he was astonished at the at the doctrine of the Lord, the teaching about, about Christ. Oh, good stuff, brother. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, people might say, well, where is this doctrine of the Lord he's referring to? Uh, it says, uh, uh, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Uh, well, there's no doctrine explained that's, that's in the text. Uh, so is he? Does he think the doctrine of the Lord is is the uh, miraculous blinding of the man? That's not a doctrine. That's an anti miracle, uh, and it's a. Uh, what are we to think then? Well, it, it's because um, I mean Ted talked earlier about uh, verse seven and eight, but but even then it doesn't say as it did so many times throughout Acts, it goes into an actually a gospel presentation. There's no gospel presentation recorded here. So what do we assume? I think it's just logical to assume that there was one given. It's just not written down at this particular time. Uh, and uh, uh, he received the doctrine. He, he, they did teach him the doctrines of salvation. And uh, he believed. They, they probably t t explained it to him before the blindness or after the blindness, uh, but he understood that uh, what he needed to understand to get saved, uh, and the blindness was just a sign that, hey, uh, if you need proof here, watch this. Here's a miracle to show you that we have the power of God. Uh, so we've we've seen a lot of miraculous things, uh, miraculous healings, but we've also seen a lot of miraculous killing and now a miraculous blinding. Um, getting back to something Joe said earlier, I talked about the atheist uh, and uh, uh, the, how do you phrase it, Evan evangelist of Satan. Um, it's a more of a contemporary term that I see a lot, uh, I've used it here on YouTube, is uh, an atheist on steroids is, is what we would call an anti-theist. Uh, and atheist literally translates to uh, 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 no belief in God. You believe there is no God. Uh, but anti-theist says, not only do I not believe that God exists, but you, don't, you shouldn't believe it either. I'm on a campaign. I'll be an evangelist to turn you away from this foolishness of, that there's a God. That's what anti-theists are. And so that's, that's uh, and this is an, this guy's an ancient example of these anti-theists that we encounter here on YouTube. Fortunately, most of the atheists, though, like you meet in life apart from YouTube, uh, you know, they're pretty, pretty much uh, uh, like like a closet Christian. A person's not always talking about their faith. Most atheists are not always talking about atheism. You have to be pretty much of a fanatic atheist to always talk about atheism. You know. Um, all right. Uh, did we all talk about that verse, and, and, and should we conclude now? I don't remember if everybody spoke. Yeah, we, we all spoke up to it, uh, unless Ted has something to add. All right, then let me just ask each of you to 
kind of sum it up again as usual, and then I'll, I'll give a brief gospel message. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I, I what struck me uh, is we started our study today with uh, a miracle from God and a judgment from God, and we've ended our study today with a miracle from God and a judgment from God. And in between those two events, uh, we have the transition. Uh, you or Ted Wan made this point, and it, it, it's the transition point of the New Testament from Peter towards Paul. And you could almost look at it as if uh, the Jews have been ministered and talked about first, and now we're turning our attentions to the Gentiles. And so we're in that transition from Peter to Paul. And uh, so, uh, kind of funny how we started and ended. That's my summary. Well, uh, I think what I'm getting out of this, this chapter that we're up to now here, and just, uh, what, 12 verses into it, I see just the main emphasis is that the apostles were, uh, were led, obviously, filled with the Spirit for, for the sending of, of Paul and Barnabas out, uh, the, the belief in prayer, the submission to God to, uh, to send, uh, not only to, to just send, but I think back up there we found, found that uh, Barnabas and, and Paul were, were, were separated, were singled out. The Holy Spirit is saying, these are the two guys I want. And so that, that, the, the choosing uh, and the being receptive of that came through the, uh, the, the disciples there praying and fasting and seeking God for wisdom and for direction. And God was faithful to provide that. And I think that's uh, something we can do when we're seeking, praying God, and looking into the revelation that he's given us, you know, the Bible, the Word of God, his wisdom. Uh, these guys definitely were seeking God for that uh, type of thing, and God was faithful to provide it. That's what I'm getting out of this. And, uh, and then once Paul and Barnabas are sent, uh, then uh, they were faithful to preach the word, faithful to preach the message God had given them, share it with the, first the Jews in the synagogues, and then not, not only to proclaim it, but to resist the evil that came in their path. Um, this is something I think we're going to see more of, uh, of uh, in the coming chapters in Acts, is the boldness of Paul and Barnabas not to be cl closet Christians, but to be bold with the message, uh, not be closet Christians, and to not only proclaim truth but resist evil. You know, overcome evil with good by proclaiming the truth and being uh, submissive to the Holy Spirit and His will, and uh, you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit. All, all that ties into it. There's, there's a lot in this chapter. There's a lot in it. So, uh, good stuff, brother. Thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, this regarding this uh, the gospel message. It's it's. I'm going to tell you what uh, Paul told this uh, uh, this man. Uh, it was called here the the doctrine of the Lord, and he believed and he saved. What was it he told him? Um, the simplest way I can say it is he told him that Jesus is the Savior. Think about what that means. Jesus is the Savior. Uh, I'm emphasizing the word the because that emphasizes he's the one and only. Uh, the, there is no salvation for, through Moses or Buddha or Muhammad or the Pope or the Virgin Mary. Salvation only comes from Jesus. He's the one and only Savior. Um, salvation does not come from any kind of religious philosophy or way of life like joining religions, following a set of religious rules, uh, changing your life and trying to make yourself presentable to God. No, that's not the Savior. The Savior, the means of salvation, is a person, Jesus Christ. Um, so if you think that you're going to go to heaven so, by some other means, by belief in a different person, a uh, different God, a different uh, um, uh, method of salvation, then you're going to be very uh, tragically disappointed because the Bible says 
that there's one way to be saved, it's faith in Jesus Christ. Now, faith in Jesus means faith in him and not something else. So it means your faith must be entirely in him. You've got to, this is what the Jews, the Jewish believers have to learn in the book of Acts. And, and that is that they've got to leave their faith in Judaism behind. Your faith cannot be divided in, in, uh, between practicing your religion and your faith in Jesus. You've got to have no faith in your religion, no faith in your personal merit. And instead, as we say here in Las Vegas, a gambling term, I'm all in. You're betting everything you have. You're putting all your faith on this person, Jesus. And you're believing that he alone has the ability to get you to heaven. And that he He promises you he, you're, he's going to take you to heaven. And that he will be faithful. He keeps his promises. And therefore, because you put your faith in him, you are guaranteed you are going to heaven. Not because of your religion, or not because of your personal merit, but because of Jesus alone. Uh, now, Jesus is not just merely a man. He's not merely a prophet. He's not a created being like an angel. Uh, he is eternal, God Almighty. And yet he came down from heaven and became a man. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. He said the, the reason he came, became a man was so that he could die for our sins. And that's what he did. He died on a cross, paid for all our sins. And that's why you get to go to heaven. Because he paid for your sins. Uh, but... You only get to go to heaven if you put your faith in him because he says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you can laugh that off and say, oh, what an arrogant, egotistical, boastful thing to say. Or what an insane thing to say. Or you can say, thank you, Jesus. I, I believe you. I'm going to depend on you. Put your faith in Jesus now and be guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Oh, by the way, after they killed him, after three days he raised himself back to life bodily and he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days and he did this to prove that his claims are all true. He is God. He is the Savior. All right. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, hopefully maybe we can continue doing this tomorrow, 2.30 Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.